What's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of Keeping Up with the Commanders. Today, we have on Calvin Kaplan, the host of the Second and Goal Fantasy Podcast. Calvin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mason. I'm excited to be here, locked in. It's a beautiful day yeah. outside here in D.C., blue skies, mm -hmm. and I am more than excited about this Commanders training camp so far that we've seen over the last few days. Yeah, it's, like again, the Commanders started training camp last Wednesday. They've been now through four practices they had sunday off so we no pads yet for the commanders but we've got a lot of takeaways from the first four days we'll start with probably one of the bigger storylines here heading uh, i guess heading into training camp and into the season i mean the starting quarterback sam Howell. he's had some roller coaster performances on when on wednesday thursday and friday he looked pretty good saturday not so much what did you like out of Sam Howell, and what stood out to you the most about him so far in camp? Well, I liked his improvement in areas such as footwork. And I mean, some of that you're not going to see right away reflect itself on the field because it's something that takes time. But I liked hearing him in interviews talk about how he's been consistently not only already mastered this offense, it sounds like coming into the training camp, which is amazing considering that mm -hmm. Eric Bieniemy is bringing in this new West Coast offense that is in some ways similar, but also in some ways very different to what we had with Scott Turner, but also the fact that Howell has been consistently working on his footwork, been cons putting in the hours, it seems like putting in the effort. And from what I've heard from people such as JP Finley, who are around the team, many analysts around the country may be surprised to see a leap there overall. So I think that's the positives. I think the negatives are, Obviously, it's to be expected that we're going to see some mistakes, some interceptions against this dominant defense, but he has been getting pressured a lot and letting that pressure get to him at times with some bad throws, some forced throws, some Taylor Heineke-esque throws, you could yes. say, when he forces yes. them when under lots of pressure, trying to make the hero play. And so mm -hmm. that's something he definitely needs to cut back on. Yeah, I agree. And something that really impressed me, like you said, is how much it seems like he already knows Eric Bieniemy's offense. I know he also said that it's kind of similar or... A lot of it was similar to what he had at UNC with the RPOs and all of that, allowing him to run the football um, pretty much whenever, like allowing him with some designed runs and all that. So um, it's been it's a little bit similar to UNC how Eric Bieniemy runs his offense. But I'm super excited to see Sam Howell again. He's going up against a really good defense. Threw an interception to Emmanuel Forbes on Saturday. He almost threw a second one if Forbes didn't bobble it out of bounds. And I think there was a, a third one, too, on Saturday that was almost intercepted. So really struggled on Saturday. It's It wasn't – the interceptions wasn't really entirely his fault. It was some poor decision-making, but also the offensive line was not great. And especially – it hasn't been great so far in training camp, but especially on Saturday against the front four. And now it seems like Jack Del Rio and Ron Rivera decided – to implement some five five man fronts uh, during training camp so far, so that might be something that we see in the season, which has not really been a thing for Washington for the past few years. But Sam Howell is really he he's been under pressure a lot, and it's not given the offensive line is not helping him at all. Yeah, it's that's the one thing that I think we're really just not going to see improvement on in this season. I would expect that Washington has a, probably a bottom ten offensive line again this year, if not bottom. I'd say five. worse. Yeah. yeah, it's it's just going to be they just haven't done enough in the offseason to get anything. I expect Andrew Wiley could be a bright spot at right tackle. And with Cosme operating next to him at right guard, that could be a good side of the line. But Charles Leno is just consistently prone to holding penalties. And there's just not much on the entire left side of the line and at center that we've seen that really begets like a ton of optimism so far so i think it's not going to get better and it's just something that sam howell is going to have to struggle through the bright side to me is that i think this is really the only area on the team that doesn't have at least some potential to develop into like an average or better unit but yeah. at the same time it's going to be just a thorn in the side of the team all season long when they, especially when they face good defensive lines oh yeah and again in the nfc east you look at philadelphia's defensive line dallas's defensive line even new york's defensive line this offensive line, if it doesn't, again, you can't really judge them that much because, again, not in pads yet. That pads come on, on Tuesday. But, like, from what we've seen so far, it's it's looking a little bit uh, questionable for um, heading into this season. We knew it was not going to be great already, but, again, going up against um, – you, you're still going up against with Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne. Those are some pro bowlers on yeah. that defensive line. But uh, it's not looked great at all. How um, – I think – 
definitely is going to get some. I mean, he's getting experience about how bad this offensive line is going to be. He's going to need to, uh, again, during that Week 18 game, he wasn't really under pressure that much in that one. Uh, he was, like, there was some some instances for sure, but I felt like he he got the ball out quickly, which is something that Eric Bieniemy I know, is definitely going to bring to this offense. It felt like last season with Scott Turner, you had Heineke holding the ball for way too long, Wentz holding the ball for too long. I think Eric Bieniemy, especially with the RPOs and stuff, He's want he's gonna to want to get how he's gonna he's going to want to get how to throw the ball as fast as possible as quickly as possible because he knows that offensive line is not going to give him more than probably like two and a half seconds most of the time. So yeah, uh, it's, yeah. it's gonna look a lot different ideally with how getting the ball out quick, throwing those timing routes, expecting the receivers to be there. The good part is we can have lots of confidence in these receivers, and I know we'll oh, get yeah. to this a little bit later, I'm sure as well, but. The receiver depth so far has been really, really solid, in my opinion, just that there are a lot of guys at the back of the roster who all have a chance to really make it in those final one or two spots and oh, yeah. going out at training camp. Yeah, you look at it, I think before last week's episode, Byron Pringle was not a Washington commander yet. So again, commander signed Byron Pringle, I think last Wednesday, maybe it was last Tuesday. But he's now, he's, this isn't like a, I know JP Finley has said and stuff, Byron Pringle isn't a camp body. Like he's going to make the 53 man roster. He's going to be the wide receiver four on this team. It's going to leave two, maybe three spots open for the UDFAs and the uh, younger wide receivers to possibly get a spot. We've got Terry, Jahan, Curtis, and Byron. But beyond that, guys like Kaz Allen have to step up, Mitchell Tinsley, maybe some other guys, Kyrick McGowan could possibly make it. Dax Milne is probably the most experienced out of the bunch. But what are your thoughts on the UDFA wide receivers like Kaz Allen and Mitchell Tinsley so far? Yeah, I think Kaz Allen's definitely the one, especially on day three, who we heard the oh, most yeah. about. And I think at the end of the day, if I had to put odds on whether Dax Milne was going to make the roster, I'd put it under 50%. But I still think he has the best chance out of the maybe the group of those guys, just like you said, because of his experience. He's not particularly explosive on returns, but he does enough. He's like serviceable in that yeah. area. I do yeah. think, obviously, Deami Brown, maybe Deami Brown's not considered quite a lock for the roster, but I think he definitely makes it. I think yeah. there's five guys we have that mm-hmm. definitely go in ready to make it. I think the commanders will end up keeping six and yeah. keep probably Milne, but there's a number of other guys. I think Tinsley and Allen. Allen would be the number two most likely for me, followed by Tinsley. Yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know why I completely forgot about Deami Brown because that guy had a week at training camp. I know on Thursday and Friday, both of those days, he was making some incredible catches and was really targeted a lot by Jacoby Brissett and Sam Howell. He got some first team reps on Saturday. It was um, it was very impressive for a guy who has not done much besides the one game last year against Tennessee. Deami Brown could def- I think Deami Brown. I don't know. Yeah, again, I don't know why I forgot about him, but he's definitely roster lock in my opinion. And then Dax. Uh, and so Byron Pringle would be the fifth. And then that sixth spot. Again, Dax Milne. I don't think, I don't think both Dax Milne and Kaz Allen make the team. It's either one of the one or the other. They play very similar roles uh, as terms of being a special team re- returner and all that. So personally, I would go with Kaz Allen. I feel like he's more explosive. He's got younger legs compared to Dax Milne. I know Dax Milne's still pretty young, but f- from last year, he was I guess serviceable because he never really muffed a punt or anything. But his returns were just like horrendous in my opinion i think allen would be the better choice there yeah and there's also the option of a guy like marcus kemp but i just honestly don't think he makes the roster because first of all we've seen so little from him in these prior years other than that one explosive game he had like a few years back with the chiefs but like at at the end of the day with that last roster spot you are looking for explosiveness and that's going to be the edge that kaz allen's going to have over dax milne because they don't have like there's no true archetype for like a return man that the commanders have right now. I mean, I guess Byron Pringle could be, but I think it, with that last spot, they'll probably want to get their return man as well as their sixth receiver. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, Kyrick McGowan also he's on the training camp roster again. Don't think he's going to make it again. Um, he didn't make it last year, as I want to say he was a UDFA last year. I'm not hundred percent sure, but. Um, yeah, I don't think he's going to – I don't really think he has a shot at making the 53. But, yeah, the wide receivers, really strong spot. Uh, also, again, Washington, they came into training camp this year very healthy. 
for all their players. I was compared to last year where they were with in terms of health. This year, besides Armani Rogers, who had that season-ending injury, which again is very, very big hit in my opinion, and then uh, Xavier Henderson, I think, or I'm not, I forgot what his name was, but it was a UDFA safety that they ended up releasing anyways after a day that like it was like the day after he got put on the IR or something. But um, both of those guys got had season-ending injuries. But beyond that, everyone is healthy, including Chase Young, 2020, uh, the 2020 second overall pick. And so far, Chase Young has come back without the without the knee brace. Same with Logan Thomas. But man, Chase Young so far has looked absolutely incredible. That would be huge. That would could make this offensive their defensive line, which I think is going to be top five, top three next year, could make it the number one defensive line overall in the league next year. It could mm -hmm. that that's the upside, obviously, with a guy like Chase Young with a talent like him. But this is what you expect to see from him coming back from this injury. I would say if we didn't see Chase Young after having a full offseason to rehab come in and look sharp and explosive, it would be a problem. Obviously, it's a good sign to see him like this, but I don't think it's necessarily going to indicate that he's suddenly going to become what we all thought he would. I think it's a little bit, it, it, there's no, I, I feel like there's no longer that big possibility that Chase Young becomes like an elite Nick Bosa type for an, the next guy to come out of Ohio State and be an elite defensive edge rusher but he will be better than he is last was last year the question is will he elevate to the level of somebody like Montez Sweat I think that potential is there I don't think he's going to be the best edge rusher in the league or maybe a top three edge rusher in the league but if he continues to play fully cut hard keep uh like have more things in his repertoire besides, besides um, with like pass rusher moves besides just spe using his elite speed and quickness to get past defenders and becomes more of like an overall balanced edge rusher, I think, um, and stays patient, I would say, is the biggest thing, especially in the running game. Could He could definitely have a, a leap this year. It's a big prove-it year for him, of course. I think we're going to see better out of him, but I don't think I don't think he if, – if I had to predict it right now, I don't think he's going to end up being the best or even maybe the second best guy on this defensive line by the end of the year. Yeah, I do think, like you said, he's going to play better than he was in 2022 because, that, I mean, he came back from that 20 ACL, or it wasn't just a 20 ACL. It was like his entire knee got blown up. But uh, it was, he what you could tell, it he wasn't the same. He didn't have that explosiveness. I know he, in 2022 and in 2021, before he got uh, injured, it was, he had this thing, he had like this false step, um, that he had off the snap and that really kind of it made his power not as powerful when he because again that guy he's a great combination of speed and power what you want to see in a elite pass rusher he has the talent to um be an elite pass rusher but like his footwork and stuff off the snap was really a struggle in 2021 and 2022 which was the reason why he wasn't as successful coming in the camp He's really gotten rid of that false step off the line. He's been able to get generate a ton of power off of his back foot. And again, he's only going up against Charles Leno. So again, <laughs> we also have to look at that. Leno, again, not one of the greatest left tackles in the NFL right now. So um, he's going to go up against some better competition. If he plays in the preseason, which I hope he does, and I expect he does, he'll go up, go up against better competition and then once the season comes around as well. So Chase Young, a guy who's coming off of injury. Also, I want to talk about a little bit Eric Bien. We talked about this a little bit already, but Eric Bien's influence so far in practice, just overall. I know I, I've been there every single day this uh, this past week, and the difference from Eric Bien to Scott Turner last year, um, Bien brings like a energy that just wasn't even remotely there last year. Ron Rivera, like. You could tell how much say the enemy has in just the practice and the team overall in terms of the length of the practice, the intensity of the practice. Because last year, Ron Rivera, those practices last year were like 90 minutes long, maybe 100 minutes long max. They weren't that intense. It was kind of surprising sometimes they ended so quickly. One of them was like only like an hour long. Mm -hmm. But this year, like they're going two hours, two hours plus every single day. They ramped up for like two days. It was a 90-minute day and then a 100-minute day. But then after that, it's been two hours, two-plus hours every single day. I expect next week pads are going to be on for like Tuesday and Wednesday most likely. 
they're, they're going to be going at it. It is hot out there, but man, Eric Bieniemy has really like changed the whole dynamic of the practice and um, the intensity of it. Yeah, and obviously you're able to speak to that much better than I am, having not been to training camp mm -hmm. in person as of yet, which I will be at some point, like in the next. Uh, I forget which day I'm going. It's either August 8th or August 9th, I think. And I'm really excited to be there. It'll be my first time actually going to a training camp in Ashburn. Oh, nice. But just yeah. to speak to speak to the hire itself, it's really, really going to be huge for the offense. Like you said, with the energy, that's the main thing. And being, the players being pushed more, I think the more like I, – I feel I feel like the enemy is going to be able to connect with players better than Scott Turner did in those ways. But also just the fact that the main knock on Scott Turner was – really how he just out he was continued to outthink himself and try to be overly creative with play calls and he never stuck with what worked it was always a new thing every week and sometimes you'd be like oh well last week was such a disaster i'll settle for this but i mean scott turner was never very consistent he was qu quite unpredictable but sometimes in all the wrong ways and the offense i felt like never came into a groove with him in a lot of games and the, put a lot of points left a lot of points on the table i don't think it's going to be the case with eric Bieniemy. i mean he's really should be in a head coaching job by now this was a st incredible stroke of luck that the commanders were able to get him and the fact that he's completely in charge of the whole offense it seems like I don't think Ron's the best coach in terms of like in, uh, in offensively, given that he was a former linebacker, that's going to change things. And I think there'll be less of a slow start and more points put on the board this year. Yeah. You can also, I know I practiced like last year, you can't really, even though, okay. So I, I how do I word this? So last year's training camp, right? There wasn't that many fans compared to this year's, which it's been packed every single day, over 10,000 fans on Saturday. Um, so uh, tra training camp practices this year were louder than last year's but even last year I couldn't really hear what Scott Turner was saying or what any of the coaches were saying compared to this year where even over these large crowds of people I can hear Eric Bieniemy talking to Sam Howell like for basically like yelling to his offense and stuff he's super vocal you can hear him even yeah like I said over the crowds and stuff um it's just been really cool to watch and really cool to see how after every drive that Sam Howell does on 7 on 7, 11 on 11, he goes over to Eric Bianami and they talk it over, talk over the, what went right, what went wrong, how do you learn from him and stuff. Just Eric Bianami overall. He's been super nice to the fans too. He's taken pictures with a few. Um, yeah, it's just been incredible to see how much of an upgrade it's been from Scott Turner to Bianami. But yeah, um, so we kind of talked about some already, but. I kind of wanted to give out um, a, one standout on offense and one standout on defense for each of us. So I guess here we'll start with the offense. Who is your offensive standout for training camp so far? Mine's probably one of the – I think there's two that stand out, and the the one, mm -hmm. the other one is the one you have. But for me, it's Brian Robinson, and we saw it the second we opened camp with his spectacular catch that he had yeah. off of the ball from Sam Howell. The fact that he's continued to actually catch passes out of the backfield and look solid there is exciting, mm -hmm. but – Really, in my opinion, it's no surprise at all that we're seeing Brian Robinson run this well and catch this well, because this is one thing that you're like nat nationally, uh, analysts have been giving him a lot of disrespect, especially for his lack of efficiency. I feel as though these those last few games, I forget what week it was when he started being really efficient. I want to say it was week 12 or week 13. But mm -hmm. after week 12, week 13, Brian Robinson looked like a different running back. He didn't look like he didn't look slow. He looked like he was actually breaking tackles like he was drafted to do. And, of course, coming back from the, the gruesome leg injury, of course, that he had that obviously he was lucky that yeah. it wasn't even worse and he wasn't out for longer periods of time. But still, he was dealing with a lot of pain in that leg. I'm sure still does deal with pain in the leg. Mm -hmm. But it seems to be at a lot more manageable point for him to where he's actually just as explosive as he used to be. And that's massive. He is underrated across the country right now. I feel like he's going to come in and be – uh, just in terms of pure running, a top 15, maybe even top 10 guy in, in in terms of running backs around the NFL. He's been a huge standout. I expect that to continue. Yeah, and last year, I think he said in one of his press conferences from this week, he was saying how he was never 100% healthy last year. Like the, the, like the gunshot wounds were still – it was really painful from his in his leg that he was saying. But now he said training camp, fully healthy, no more pain in his leg. He's ready to go, and uh, you're, you're going to see this when you go to training camp uh, whenever you go, but he is so much more lean than last year. 
Like the guy, he he looks he's super built, but he's so much more lean. I feel like he's a lot faster than last year. He's way more explosive. Um, like you said, he's been able. We didn't really see it that much at Alabama, but he's able to catch the ball out of the backfield. Like he can go up and he can. He's got hops. He he can go up and catch a ball. So. Um, yeah, that, that's a great pick. And my pick here is Logan Thomas, which I would I was not expecting to say Logan Thomas through the first week of camp. I really thought that he wasn't going to be on the team for this year. Um, he is getting really – he's, what, 31 now, I want to say, maybe yeah. 32. But, I mean, he's still looking really explosive. He had some great catches over the middle of the field um, on Saturday from Sam Howell. So, he, he yes, probably Saturday was his best day, but pretty much overall the entire camp he's looked really, really explosive, especially for a guy's age. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. So now here I'm gonna go to your for your defensive player. Yeah, mine's gonna be Quan Martin, of course, rookie out of Illinois, second round pick. Now coming in to play the safety slash nickel slash whatever they need him to do hopefully to be some sort of yeah like do it all like jack of all trades kind of player he's going to have a chance to be on the field for some like first team snaps right away which obviously is a second round pick when you're going in the first to the second round that's what you want but we're going to see him out there i expect on day one against the cardinals and to me he fits not the same kind of not the exact same archetype as a guy like landon collins because of course later in his tenure with Washington, he really specialized more as a safety slash linebacker who really was solely yeah. just fitting the run and making big plays behind the line, which Quan Martin can do so much more than, but he has that ability as well. So he's a unique kind of player that really fits fits well into the defense, not in necessarily just inserting him, oh, here, you're playing outside corner, but just really to do anything, to be in packages, to be a rotational player, but a guy who's not just like a rotational player because he's bad, a rotational player to really add some life to the defense, add, add that spark that I think, especially in terms of playmaking, getting interceptions, making big tackles in the middle of the field. Yeah, I think Quan Martin has the highest floor out of any of the of the commanders picks this year. I think, especially a bunch of the beat reporters are saying it. His ability, like him in the offense, oh, uh, sorry, not offense. The defense already is already. Um, like he's already making plays. It feels like he's super. He's already super smart. He's reading the offense, reading what they're doing. He's super sticky in coverage too. I've been watching him as well. So uh, that's a great pick. I'm gonna go with the other Washington defensive back rookie in Emmanuel Forbes. I think, well, Forbes so far, we mentioned the interception on Saturday, but man, like he is looking really good. And I think that he could definitely be a candidate, if not possibly even win defensive rookie of the year this year, because he's he already has the pickoff of Sam Howell. Uh, he almost had a second pickoff of Sam Howell on the same day. And he wasn't really targeted much on the Thursday and on the Friday. But he got he looked really good on Saturday. I will say on Friday, I believe he got burned by Terry McLaurin. Kind of, they posted it on the Twitter, but yeah. uh, it was just a perfectly placed ball from Sam Howell. So I there's really for nothing Forbes could do with it there, anyways. If he caught up with him, but um, yeah, besides that, Forbes has looked very very good so far in training camp, and I I really think he could go for like four maybe five interceptions this season and just his rookie year which probably could get him defensive rookie of the year so i I mean i'm super excited i wasn't excited at the time for the pick i really think we should have gone with christian gonzalez but with the uh scheme and stuff with jack del rio has forbes fits really well and i think he could definitely um get some interceptions this season so yeah those are some of the yeah so you go ahead yeah, he adds that ability for game-changing plays, like you mentioned, four interceptions, mm-hmm. five interceptions. To add that is just going to be so huge because I feel like this yeah. team for years has been bottom of the league and turnovers forced. That If that changes mm-hmm. at least somewhat, that would be massive. And like you mentioned, Terry McLaurin burned him at times. He's had some times where some fans who are definitely in the minority and more casual fans get on him for like, why is Emmanuel Forbes not sticking to him? We're not expecting Emmanuel Forbes to stick with Terry McLaurin every snap when even guys like Darius Slay and Trayvon Diggs look silly with Terry McLaurin Mm -hmm. at times. Like he's going to look silly and he's going to get burnt, but the fact that he's still making plays and sticking with it means that he has really had an impressive performance. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, I mean, I'm excited for Forbes. Uh, I think Washington last year was towards the bottom of the league 
in turnovers. I think we were one of the worst at yeah. one point. I think we were actually like 30 seconds. So uh, Forbes bringing in four or five turnovers, plus again, you get Chase Young back, who forced many turnovers in his rookie year. And if you can just do half of what he did his rookie year, plus you still have Deron Payne in that entire defensive line, you still got other guys in the secondary. This defense, they've seen we've seen it already in training camp. This defense definitely has the ceiling to be just, I think, the best in the NFL with just how well-rounded it is. Um, I we're going to go, yeah, I guess this is a good segue into the strengths and weaknesses of this team. We're going to stick with the defense because I think, yeah, that, that'll be better. But um, the secondary is looking really great. I think the defensive line is probably the strength of the defense. Um, the weakest part, pro- you can probably agree here, is probably the linebackers. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't. I mean, besides, you you lost Cole Holcomb. You get Cody Barton, who I think is like the same, slightly better, maybe, but he's about the same as Cole Holcomb. Um, he he did have an interception though against Jacoby uh-huh. Brissett uh yeah. yesterday, I think. So, um, he Barton is actually looking pretty solid. Jamin Davis, I haven't really heard much of him. I know he's he didn't attend OTAs this year, I believe, and he wasn't getting first team reps to start training camp. I think it was just to ramp him up because by Saturday he was get, he was with the first team defense. But um yeah, the linebacker, how do you feel how confident are you in the linebacker room this year? Um, not that confident, but I also don't think we're going to have to re- rely on it very much. Like you mentioned, the five man fronts is one thing that's really mm-hmm. huge and that's really something that only the commanders do like not not uh, other teams of course run that personnel sometimes as well but no team really does it much more than like 10 or 15 percent of the time and the commanders could end up doing it like way more than that like there's very few teams that just have the depth to be able to do it but with washington there's four just absolute studs who are starting and there needs to be ways to get Fidarian mathis on the field fa obata on the field james smith williams on the field those are three guys and even like kj henry kj henry yeah went in the fifth round should have gone much higher is going to be a big breakout um all four of those guys and there's even other names too but those are the four main ones will need to be on the field and because their fresh legs who are going to provide explosive potential. I think we'll see a lot of the five. The, the commanders will easily lead the league in the amount of times they have five defensive linemen. And with the, we there's now enough depth with how much was spent in the draft on secondary to where there'll probably be two linebackers on the field a lot. Where yeah, whether maybe even one defensive linemen, two linebackers, and five in the secondary or five, two, four, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Really, Jamin Davis and Cody Barton will be all they need a lot of the time as long as neither of them get injured. Yeah, I, I get the depth on the linebackers, not that great. I was really hoping we'd see some breakout-type stuff in training camp from Kalik Hudson, who I've been waiting to break out for a while now, but he just hasn't done anything. David yep. Mayo, we already know who he is. Like, th- I don't think there's really – he doesn't really have a higher ceiling. I don't think he's going to play any better than he has in the past. But I, I, could, I would argue that I think only one linebacker would be on the field for – Pro- for a good amount of time because if you look yeah. at the safeties you got cam curl Derek Forrest, drafted quan martin uh martin could play uh like the nickel you could make you could have hold on you could have yeah you could have you could play nickel for a, a good amount of time because yeah. of just the depth you have in the secondary so um again if someone gets hurt in the linebacker room things aren't going to go that great but if cody barton and Jamin davis stay healthy I think they will be good enough so that the other the other places in the defense like survive and pick up the slack there. So that's yep. pretty much yeah the strengths and weaknesses of the defense. Moving on to the offense, we've talked about the weakness a little bit, but I guess we can go more in depth. But it's pretty obviously the offensive line. If you if we're gonna exclude quarterback, because I feel quarterback is is like we don't really know yet with quarterback. Yep how good Sam Howell is, so I'm just going to leave that out of it. But I think the offensive line, for sure, is in a worse position than the quarterback room right now. By far, yeah. And the fact that I know recently we saw Chris Paul now move up to the first team instead of Sadiq Charles, I, I don't really think we're, this means we're seeing good things out of Chris Paul. I more think it's that Sadiq mm-hmm. Charles has been very underwhelming. And th- this left side of the line especially is just looking really, really bad. Like Ricky Stromberg out of Arkansas in the third round is like mm-hmm. uh, going to be a fine pick. But it's just hopefully, I mean, at, at best, it really is only going to help 
the team really survive at that position. It's interesting that Nick Gates is playing at center instead of a guard spot where you could argue they need him more. Hopefully that's not a reflection yeah. on Ricky Stromberg, a guy like that. But uh, especially, I mean, at left, it left guard is probably the weakest spot, followed sure. by center, followed by left tackle. Yeah, for sure. I... I mean, through three practices or whatever we've gone to, I will say Ricky Stromberg has definitely unimpressed me. Like he's not impressed me so far. It, mm-hmm. He had multiple um, like snap issues so far. Uh, same with Nick Gates as well. Nick Gates he sailed a snap over the head of Sam Howell on Saturday, and then that um, that took uh, the first team off. Yeah, the first team offense off the field. Second team offense comes in, and Ricky Stromberg puts one in the dirt for Sam Howell. So mm-hmm. it's this, I mean, that was like the first pretty big mess up in terms of the snaps and stuff. Um, I feel like for training camp, but Stromberg overall hasn't really been impressive. I really thought that he would be fighting for a, for the starting center position. And then you could move Gates over, like you said, to left guard, because that position is not looking great at all. But um yeah, it's not it's not been working so far for Stromberg, and I know it's only been one week, and again, we're not in pads yet, but I I'm hoping when pads come on, we see some more physicality out of Stromberg because also I do want to mention on Saturday, Nick Gates did go down with a little bit of an ankle injury. He seemed fine. He got back um, and was in uh, doing drills later on in practice, but again, if an injury goes down to this offensive line. Like it, like it has in the past in 2022, where that offensive line, we we were starting nobodies for some of those weeks because it was so injured. So, um, yep. yeah, I'm not, I'm not that confident in uh, in the offensive line pretty much at all. Yeah, and it's already bad even before any injuries at all. So one injury, like you said, I mean, this is, usually this team hasn't had one injury. They've had four or five, six or more. Like, it's 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 going to happen, and there's probably going to be an issue again with it this year, just as big as it was last year. Yeah, so, yeah, that's pretty much probably the biggest weakness on the offense. And I think the biggest strength is um, also – I mean, th- there's a lot of strengths on this offense, I would say. Um Wide receiver is probably the best position overall. I feel like we have a lot of depth at it. Terry's been looking like Terry McLaurin. Nothing like bad, which is good. Jahan Dotson, he was off to a slow start in training camp early on, but Dotson really picked it up uh, towards the end of practice on Friday. And then Saturday, he looked great. Was targeted Saturday. I, I feel like Jahan Dotson kind of turned into Sam Howell's favorite um, weapon, I would say, or favorite receiver towards the end of the first first week of training camp because I mean he was targeting him a ton uh or was, whether it be over the middle of the field um I I will say I think uh this offense this is a little bit off topic but this offense like they, they were throwing a lot of screens last uh not last year but in during training camp screens Sam Howe loves to dump the ball off for some reason just a ton wasn't really taking that many shots but I, th- I think this wide receiver room could definitely make up for that. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully we'll see Curtis Samuel involved in that a ton as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, you got Samuel. De'Ami, if De'Ami Brown can, like, if he lives up to the hype that he's getting right now, this wide receiver room is very scary and probably one of the best in the league. But, yeah. I, again, I, I don't really trust him at this point where he is. Yeah. I'd want to see more from him. him so, but, yeah, that's... um. Anything else you want to add about the wide receivers? Yeah, I'm just that, like you said, it, it's the biggest strength of the offense. Jahan Dotson now is getting more hype from, I feel like, national media, which I've brought up multiple mm-hmm. times throughout the show. Is that like he's one of those guys, I would say, last year that was really just underrated. If you watched, but if you actually watched what he was, the the routes he ran, of course, the, in his like catches, yards after the catch last year, playing with nobody's at QB or t- yeah. playing with Taylor Heineke, playing with Carson Wentz, just he was ex- really, really productive. And he's going to be facing every team's number two corner. He's going to look really, really good and face a lot of weak number two corners and really just torch defenses next year. Yeah, that week one game against the Cardinals, Marco Wilson as that cornerback one. Beyond that, I don't even know who's on that Cardinal in the Cardinals secondary. So that's going to be a lovely game for the Washington Commanders to get their season underway and the new era of the Washington Commanders underway as well. 
Um, looking ahead, like I mentioned, pads come on on Tuesday. I expect them to stay on for Wednesday, but I don't think beyond that they're probably going to have a day off or maybe even two days off Thursday, Friday in terms of not having pads. Um, longer practices, I think Ron Rivera said, I mean, they've already reached two hours and Eric Bianami is like keeping them there for two hours every single day. Even if they tend to end early, he's creating some like extra period or whatever that they need to work on to make sure that they practice for the entire two hours. Um, that they might extend it a little bit longer. It's going to be uh, colder. It's not going to be like cold, but it's going to be colder this week than it was last week. It was like a hundred degrees for all three days that were open the fans, but this upcoming week is going to be in the eighties or low eighties. So that'll be pretty good. But yeah, anything else you want to add about training camp? Um, I don't think so. I just think that, I mean, overall, it's been really, really positive. And all training camps are really, really positive. For example, like mm-hmm. for like with the Chiefs, they're hyping up like every single random receiver they have yeah. and all, all sorts of teams hyping up everybody. But it is more positive than it was last year. It feels oh, more yeah. energetic. Obviously, the team sale is looming over everybody. But mm-hmm. we're hearing about a lot more positive things and a lot less injuries, I would say. Oh, yeah. Takeaways. Fingers crossed on that because yeah we've gone through. I mean, this we all we look we look at other teams like C.J. Gardner Johnson had that scare. Joe Burrow's already out for several weeks. Yeah, um, what's that one? Jalen Ramsey is mm-hmm. out until December. So yeah, Washington so far has been very lucky. Hopefully that luck will continue. Where can people find you on uh, social media and all that? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at Calvin underscore SGF. I host a fantasy football podcast. I that's pretty much what I'm doing in terms of content right, right now. I also do broadcasting, play-by-play broadcasting for my high school and for Northern Virginia Community College. So I'll, that th- none of those are going on right now, but in the fall they will be, and you can find out all my updates on my Twitter. All right, man, that sounds good. Thank you for hopping on this week. Um, yeah, second week of Washington Commanders training camp is it's going to be a good one. That'll be it for this week's episode of Keeping Up with the Commanders. See you guys in the next one. Peace.